in fact, everybody has, has been saying this. I really miss not being there. I've gone to your show, I don't know how many years, you know a lot of good friends there, but we're doing it virtually, but we're doing it. So it's good. Fantastic uh, Midwest way to go. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to show you a bunch of routes on my book, Ontario's Lost Canoe Routes. That actually, I'll explain, um, was a, not an easy one to uh, publish because the publisher was like, Lost Canoe Roots, who's going to buy it, Kevin? I went, well, nobody, but we'll save the roots. And now it actually uh, is the second bestseller. So obviously these roots are now being protected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the short version of the roots, about maybe a, a half to a, a three quarters. And then in a couple of weeks, if you want to go to my YouTube channel, KC Happy Camper, I'll put the whole entire thing on. Uh, but tonight, you guys are special. Um, to, 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 uh, <laughs> well, you're all special, whatever. But I'm going to actually show the presentation. And then we're going to have a Q&A afterwards. So get your questions uh, ready. And I'm going to share screen. Are we ready? Oh. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> you always need more cowbell. Just saying. All right. So another presentation virtually. No more handshake, hugging, meeting the crowd, wearing something fancy on the stage instead of track pants while you're doing the zoom <laughs> Darn all right so I, i'm actually looking forward to this one uh it, it is the lost canoes and uh i wrote a book in 2002 i think um lost canoes written a couple books for the publisher at the time they did really well and i came up with this idea saying hey you know we should tell everybody where all these lost canoes are in ontario and i remember the publisher john dennison really good guy really nice guy and uh he goes who would buy that <laughs> and i went well, you know, it really doesn't matter who buys it. It's it's more important to protect these roots that are being lost. This thing has sold a lot. A little bit of extra work, but uh, uh, a nice diversion if uh, if you roll with the punches. My idea was to promote those roots that were lost at the time in 2002, and then. I'm going to you know show you whether they're so lost because some are completely so lost and some are not. Some are really well known popular routes. So I'm going to show you those. I'm ready. All right, uh, Powers Guide to Ontario's Lost Communities. And uh, actually, on the far lower left there, that's uh, Noel Hudson. He's the editor uh, of or was uh, of, during the time of Boston Mills. And yeah, I, I took him on the, the one lost route. And I think it's the last time you and I, and I had it. <laughs> so yeah, the original book, Lost Canoe Roots, came out in 2002. And it was black and white photos, not like my other guidebooks. And basically because they're like, we're not sure this is going to sell, Kevin. So, you know, uh, we'll do it on the cheap. And I went, yeah, great. I just want it out. I just want to promote these routes. That's my purpose, whatever. And I get my 8% royalty, and whatever. Welcome to Canadian Publish. So, but later on, in the year this came out, probably a couple years later, it did so well, they brought it back uh, out in color. <laughs> so there you go. Interesting. I'm going to go over a whole bunch of uh, roots that are in the book, uh, show basically how they're doing and how they're not doing, that sort of thing, but lots of interesting roots to, to explore in Ontario. We're going to go from west to east. So I'm going to start off in Wabakimi and go all the way down to the uh, York River near Bancroft. And yeah, so splatter of roots all across northern Ontario to northeastern to north central Ontario, just Ontario. Okay, so I'm going to start off with the first uh, route, Wabakimi Provincial Park. During that time, during the early 90s, when I was you know, going off and exploring these reefs before I, I could write about them. Wabi Kimi was on my list for, for sure. I always wanted to go to Wabi Kimi because I wanted to go to Wendell Beckwith's cabin or cabins. So I'll get to that in a minute. But Wabi Kimi, to get information at that time was impossible. You would contact the park and, well, there were, really wasn't a park person. There was a park superintendent that was part of a whole bunch of other parks in, in the north. Uh, 
And I remember that person said, okay, well, to get information, you have to contact this outfitter up there. And then that, that person would, would provide you with information. Okay, no problem. I did. And that outfitter at the time said, yeah, uh, for 10, I think it was $10 a sheet, or whatever. I remember for me to do this one route was going to cost me over a hundred bucks for me to buy these print sheets that he would mail you. And I so said, whoa, you know, if I go to Gonquin, I just get a map. Like I go to Wabakini and I get nothing, except now I have to give you money for a printout sheet. And I remember the outfitter saying, well, it was me that, you know, created all these routes and therefore you should pay me. I was like, yeah, whatever. It's a park. I don't believe that. Um, nothing against outfitters whatsoever. Okay. And all the outfitters I worked with before, they know what I'm talking about. But I did not agree with that. So I just got Topo Maps and uh, went out, actually brought a film producer, Kip Spinell, uh, to film. And also Nancy Scott, which was a park planner at the time. Uh, I think she still is. And she knew the park. And I went, well, I'll just go with them. And here we go. So we went out and uh, you could drive to Armstrong from Thunder Bay, which I've done after the fact of going to Wabakini. It's a fantastic park, actually. This is actually just south of James Bay. So it's far north, right? So, oh my God, the drive from Thunder Bay to Armstrong. That's a long drive. Just warning. It's a good drive. It's just a long drive. Or you could take the train. And eventually you have to take the train anyway to do the route that I take. You could actually go from... A lake near, I think, Cameron Lake near Armstrong and do a route there as well, but it's really, you know, it's not the same. Taking the train is, is far better. So I remember Kip and I, uh, and we met Nancy at Armstrong, we, we, Kip and I took the train from Union Station and uh, in Toronto. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> taking a canoe portaging it down the street and through that was really kind of cool anyway we took the the train all the way there uh met nancy and we headed out to wapkini we did three rivers uh let me see my notes here uh i know the burg and the ogoki what was the other one uh plantation portage was part of it oh my lord Ooh, where am i uh, oh by the way we started at schultz's trail so we took uh the train and we told the train person let those off at Schultz's Trail. They knew exactly what we're talking about. This might have not changed, by the way. Uh, if we contacted the real system on phone or whatever, they were like, no, you can't do that. But no, you can. Just tell the person running the train, we went off at Schultz's Trail. They knew exactly where to, to, to drop us off. So uh, we, we started out with Schultz's Trail. Um, uh, Lookout River. The Lookout River. Uh, Fantasia Portage, which is amazing because it's all this jack pine, boreal forest, um, caribou moss. It was just beautiful. I'm not sure. Last time I was on that trail, it was a windblown nightmare. Uh, hopefully it's fixed by then. Maybe you burned over. I'm not sure. But back then, it did look like Fantasia. So it was kind of cool. So we uh, we went down the Lookout River to Smooth Rock, big, big lake. And we went down the Berg and the Goki, which is great. We went to Whitewater Lake. And then the idea, we get to this, um, we went to film Wendell Beckwith's cabins. Okay, so there's Wabakini right there, far north, north of the Lake Nipigon, north of Lake Superior, amazing place. Boreal Forest, big time, by the way, though, okay? And it's maintained more than it was before, you know, when we went. I mean, Friends of Wabakini has done an incredible amount of work. Uh, to actually help that park out and also the park itself has, has promoted a, a lot more because people are going there but it was a lost canoe route at the time I would say it's kind of somewhat lost still <laughs> but yeah all right yeah so here's the route so um uh yeah Schultz's Trail we went down to the Lookout River to Smooth Rock we went to, down to the, Go or the Berg and the Goki River to uh Whitewater Lake and then we actually uh, got to uh, um, 
the island where Wendell Beckwith's cabin was, and we stayed there for a couple of days. Now you could paddle back, which I had done um, after the fact. Uh, I've done that. I paddled, paddled back to Armstrong through Caribou Lake and this whole system too. That's all possible. We're up for a long time. If you go to Wabakimi, it's not a weekend jump. Just saying. Okay. You need to see these cabins that Wendell Beck was made. Okay. They're not as good as they were when I was there. Uh, they kind of fallen apart. Nobody really is. Well, maybe some people have tried. I think the First Nations there have tried to take care of them, but the park certainly hasn't. Um, I don't think they even want them in the park because they don't want the liability. Uh, that's another story. But yeah, um, in 1955, uh, Wendell Beckwith left his family um, to seek out the center of the universe. He believed that Pi 3.14 existed on this lake. I'm not sure if that's the reason why he went there, but that, that's the whole concept. There's a really good film that just came out. Uh, it's on the website of Thunder Bay Museum. They created an amazing film uh, on the history of this guy, and you really need to watch that. But yeah, in 1955, he, he sort of left there, and then he was a caretaker of the one cabin, some architect, um, and that was his job. But then he started building other cabins. And uh, it's a great story. You, you need to look at the whole story, but... The one cabin that he built at, at the end, uh, I think it was 1978, he called it the snail. And it was an environmental cabin built into the side of that of uh, the, this hill. And um, I, I remember going in there and the whole thing was environmentally sound beyond belief, but even the, the stove rotated with the wind. Um, it was amazing. And um, he was a mathematician and he had tons of stuff left over there. There was a telescope he tried to, to crate there there was one amazing cabin that had all the shingles mathematically precisely cut the the floorboards were all hexagonal cubes all cut he had um he had a a, a fridge that you lowered down into the, the roof cellar um but yeah so he he lived there trying to prove all his formulas he was one of the inventors of the ballpoint pen actually too um, but yeah, uh, he ended up dying in 1980 as a heart attack. I think he ate popcorn and then didn't really eat well. I think he just ate popcorn and did his mass in a snail and then he died. But check out that film. All right. The Still River Loop. This is probably so lost. Uh, actually, probably isn't because of the, the help of Rob Heslam. He's now direct instructor, uh, high school instructor uh, up there. I think he's retired now, but he would take his students and maintain this route. That was it. At, at the time, the MNR used to maintain all these routes. And that, that was when the Ontario Provincial Parks were part of the MNR, and now they're separate. But then, I mean, that didn't help matters um, in one sense. Maybe not. Maybe I don't know. But when the MNR got rid of the um, the um, forest rangers, and that kind of wasn't good, <laughs> they should never have done that because uh, a lot of maintenance was done by them. But Rob, uh, yeah, he maintained that that route, and maybe still does. But yeah, it, it's it's a lost route still. You can do this route, if you look at it, it's north of Lake Superior. You can do this route, if you look at it, you could actually forget this part here. You can actually drive up a logging road and then just do this one section of the river. 
And then even before you actually finish it, you can get off and run road there. And it was probably, you know, it would be probably like a, a, a good five day canoe ride down a nice river. But to do the entire loop is an adventure in itself and it should be done. It's an amazing river. Okay. So the Still River Loop. So you start off uh, the route at Santoy Lake if you're going to do it as a loop. And watch that lake, by the way. It's it can get really windy and it's all engulfed by cliffs. Okay. So just be very, very watchful of that lake. It can get really bad. But anyway, uh, go down Santoy Lake. I remember the first time doing this this trip, uh, I was looking for diable portage, the double portage, and it goes from Santoy to, I forget, probably Diablo Lake, I think, a little small lake, and that's your first obstacle. Oh, my Lord. That's not good. Uh, it is up a cliff like this. I literally had to put my canoe on a harness and pull it up the first part of the portage. And then you get into these sinkholes. Um, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. I, I remember my dog, uh, Bailey, my first dog, Springer Spaniel. She was ahead of me and she started whining. And I went and checked her out. And there was a lynx about to kill her. And uh, <laughs> brutal portage. Uh, good trail fishing in the, lake, in the lake you get to, though. So anyway, the section that you do, you see, uh, that you do at first, you're basically going up a series of lakes. and brush portages, hopefully someone has maintained them when you get there, but it's well worth doing the whole loop. But yeah, uh, do that section. Um, but when we went there, there was a, a burn area, which is fine, it's ecology, it, it happens. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, so check uh, Jonathan's video out uh, of, of this, uh, of this um, portage, of Diablo Portage. Jonathan is a great guy, uh, great, great YouTube channel. Lost Lakes Backcountry Angling. It used to be called Backcountry Angling Ontario or Ontario Backcountry Angling. And then he just changed the name, but check this video out. Diablo! Done. Finally. Oh, I don't know how that was only a kilometer. It felt like 10. That was awful. But the lake isn't. It's beautiful. So you look at the map, and basically this uh, this is a public launch. Go to Santor Lake, go up to Diablo Portage, go into Diablo Lake, I don't know what was right, and then go into a series of lakes all the way up and that will take you a few days uh how many people do this route still to this day and then you portage over into the still river itself and go down the river there's one major drop called rainbow falls gorgeous spot but the rest of it are like class twos might i always say more class ones in swiss along the way there is one place uh that i put on my my original book called lost tall rapid uh, I was drying a towel on my pack um, while we're paddling and it fell over and I lost it. So when I wrote the book up, I actually called that rapid lost tall rapid. And I was there a few years ago in the area, just having coffee at the coffee shop. And there was a map on the wall of the still river and that rapid was called lost tall rapid. So I could go to my grave knowing that I named a rapid. Just saying. So again, you could you could start here, uh, get a shovel uh, if you want from a local outfitter, and you basically go from here all the way down the river to this logging road and look it out. And it's a it's it's a good drift. It's, it's really good because the bad points really are Diablo Portage, all these lakes that were burned over when I was there, um, and also the the log jams below that in Saint Toy Lake. But you really should think of do, about doing the whole loop. Be quite honest. Uh, but these log jams, they change every year. 
and sometimes you can float right through them, and sometimes they're even, there's even more logs blocking the way. So that's Rainbow Falls, beautiful spot, nice campsite, but the campsite's away from the falls, so yeah, I don't know. So yeah, log gems and cliff banks on the lower part, absolutely hell, hell, <laughs> worse than Diablo Portage, to be quite honest. So why do it as a loop? Just to say that you did it as a loop. To be quite honest, I mean, imagine doing a river loop. That's rare. I mean, using your, your shovel, right? So, yeah. Check out Northern Scavengers uh, video. Great guys, uh, Alex and Noah. They've done some amazing trips. This is one of their very first trips they did when they were young kids, uh, piling a, uh, uh, I forget, no, it, it's a beat up canoe from King and Tire. Um, love with, that they did that. It's just, oh my Lord, I don't know how they ever survived that trip. So yeah, uh, great video clip of them doing the lower log jams. All right, so it looks like we're arriving at our first log jam. We haven't seen a portage yet. Holy. It goes back forever. It is a path in the portage. You want to push? Yeah. You want to push? Chaplow and the Gacinda River. It's a great trip. And I don't think anybody does this trip anymore. Okay, so it is actually uh, just out of Chaplow. Chaplow is just northeast of Lake Superior, kind of northeast of Wawa. And uh, it was a big route back in the day. Uh, back in 1937, the uh, MNR had to go in and make a campground in the town of Elsass, right here at the rail town, because there were so many people canoeing that area. Uh, there was so many tourists going that, to that area. So pretty cool. Now, I don't think anybody battles it. So it starts off in, in the town of Chapleau, uh, Racine Lake. Uh, there was an outfitter at the time with the campground there. They moved on and went to Quebec, and the, the Kippewa Lake area. I'm not sure if anybody's there now, but I do know that they sold off the place, so someone's got to be there. But the Chapleau River is a really good river, water dependent. I mean, even if it's low water, you can still do it. You're just going to be walking for quite a bit. But there's lots of rapids, not a lot of dangerous rapids, and there's portages around those rapids. Mind you, again, there, it, I don't think that route is being maintained by the government anymore, so just be aware of that. But it's still a really good route. So you finally get to Cabas Kissing Lake, which is like maybe two or three days, or three days at least down the Chapleau River. Really watch out for that lake. It's very shallow lake, so when wind picks up, it's like, man, it, it is like uh, Lake Tamiskwi. It really, it, you just keep an eye on it, okay? And um, yeah, so we paddled across that and got to the town of Elsass. I mean, Elsass, oh boy, it, it was a big town at the time. It was created in 1912, and it was a, a big thing until the 1930s. It was a logging town, lots of people live in there, I think over 300 people. Uh, then after that, I think, um, oh my lord, uh, I forget when they lived there, but there was actually only two people living there at the time. There was two guys. One was the sheriff and one was the, the mayor. They hated each other. There was a love triangle with um, some woman. There was a, a, a death or murder, depending who you talk to, on the rail in between their two houses. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I met the one guy, he was still living there. The other guy moved out and then had a heart attack. But um, I met the one guy and he was a collector of books and in his uh, cabin was one of my books. He didn't say much to me though. But there was also, when we went through, there was actually a bed and breakfast, Quigley's bed and breakfast. I don't think that exists anymore, but I, I know that, that the owner had died a few years back from cancer. But great guy and... and uh, <laughs> 
he, he he brought us in. We I don't know. I think I gave him fifty bucks, and we we got one of those cabins up the hill. We stayed at, and gave us some beer and uh, great. And um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure whatever happened to LSS, but I do know that I signed one of the paddles in the bar, which actually was a shack with a bunch of things like a Billy Bass fishing thing. I don't know. It was a weird bar, and I just signed a paddle, so it probably is still there. Here's the route. Uh, so Racine Lake, uh, we started there because that was where the outfitter was and where the campground was. And we went down the Chapla River and then went to Kapiskissing Lake and to Elsass and then loop up the Nemegasenda River, which really is not much of a river. It's more of a wetland area full of wild rice. And there's a couple of big drops along the way that you just portage around. But yeah. Uh, that, that's about it. And what we did is we, we finished here. Um, you could loop all the way back to where we started, but we just ran out of time. And uh, we actually called the outfitter and then they put our vehicle there and we picked it up. This guy, John Mitchell, uh, who was John Mitchell? I remember, I'm pretty sure he was, first name was John anyway. He was a guy from the States and we met him along the way. And a uh, great guy. In fact, actually, he dumped in some rapids um, going up the Nimbicasenda. And I pulled him out, and he, he suffered uh, hypothermia. We actually really had to take care of him. Yeah, we visited him uh, a couple years later uh, in the United States. Uh, but, yeah, he was on that trip. Poor bugger. He was, he was uh, on a trip with a um, Berlin Kruger-type canoe. It was a double-blade double type canoe. And back in the day, that was a unique thing. Uh, and he, his wife had left him. He had a, a child that was autistic, and he was taking care of the child full time. His wife had left him, and then I think he had a girlfriend that he was going to give the canoe to, and then that didn't work out. So he just took the canoe and went on a solo journey. Uh, and yeah, great, good guy. And um, he kept going. It was really funny. We le we left uh, and went to a hotel in Chapleau, and. Um, he had a bear encounter that night. So, and it, it was fine. Like he dealt with it, whatever, but we actually had a worse encounter. We went to a hotel in Chapleau, uh, which is actually right beside the OPP uh, uh, police detachment, but they came and arrested the guy that was uh, beside us in the hotel and he was wanted for murder. <laughs> so I think John was okay with the bear more than we were with the hotel. Okay. Right. Continue on. Okay. Quit back. Yeah, so there's the uh, upper uh, Nimbicasenda going up to Nimbicasenda. It's not really a river. It's more of a tranquil wetland area. It's actually a really nice paddle. The only big drop, I forget the name of the falls. I don't think there was any of the falls on the Nimbicasenda. Walk Me Lake Loop. This has to be lost, lost. It was lost when I did it, but I don't think anybody has done it since. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was a good area. I got to say, uh, so we have to look at where we are. We're actually north of uh, Lake Huron, uh, northeast of uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Lake Superior. And Wakami Lake Provincial Park is a nice campground, really nice campground that a lot of people don't go to. If you go there, you're probably just an angler trying to catch walleye at the Wakami Lake. Wakami Whalers, a uh, great band. They're, they're still around, I think. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, they originated from there because they were outdoor interpreters uh, at the time, I believe. I don't think they have that program there anymore. But yeah, here's the loop. And it's along this route. I think 100, 100 kilometers plus. Hugh Banks and I, uh, he was the biologist at the college I worked at part-time. Uh, him and I went. And we just started at, at the Provincial Park itself. Went down Lockney Lake. And then we went in, into a series of uh, liftovers and beaver dams and stuff. And then went into the Little Lockney River. Lots of history there in the past. There was a lot of, uh, there was an old trapping cabin. There was a lot of forest remnants uh, back in the day. This railway was the main way to get there. There was POW camps put there from World War II. Lots of history, but we didn't see anybody at all this entire trip. And had a hard time even finding a campsite. And then we got to uh, the, the crossover here when we went up the Wakami River itself and back to Wakami Lake. And yeah, it was a good trip. Um, Lining up the, the Wakami River itself, going across Wakami Lake. It was okay. There was actually a hiking trail too at one point. It probably still exists, but I don't know. I would ever do it. But there's a hiking trail that goes around that whole route, around Wakami uh, Lake as well. But, but nobody goes there. 
So yeah, it's lost. Ranger Lake Loop. Oh my Lord, I love this place. So when I was 12, I think 12, you know, the sip of whiskey for this one. Uh, my dad, my dad would, would take me camping uh, every year and we sometimes he would collect some money. He didn't have a lot of money. He was a provincial boxer, but then worked at the factory for the rest of his life for 45 years, actually. And I don't think he ever liked that uh, work at the factory, to be quite honest. But he did. So anyway, uh, his whole thing was uh, for him and I to go off on, on these, uh, these camping trips or fishing lodge trips. And one big thing was for us to fly into Megas Lake when I was 12. And my my, um, my brother-in-law, um, Terry, and my uncle at the time. Um, yeah, so we went in there and, you know, I... I, I got to say, that's the first time I went to uh, I was 12 years old, and we are on Megasin Lake. We attached a Clue Lake trip, but we decided to go into some side lakes with a, an old um, Grumman canoe to try for brookies and caught an amazing book too. So years later, I want to go back there. And yeah, two things of that route. Well, three things, really. Massive brook trout and lake trout, but massive brook trout. Massive old growth pine that's still there to this day. Amazing. Ogoma is amazing for it's a huge white pine and also you're not going to see anybody back in the 30s 1930s it was a very popular new trip especially for americans coming in and i'm not sure why but i got an old map from that area uh from the 30s 1933 actually and i followed the route from that and uh it's amazing you look at the ranger lake loop we started at Gong Lake. Uh, well, I, I went with filmmaker uh, Kip again, and also uh, Mrs. Scott, the park planner, because she wanted to know about this area because they were thinking of making a park at the time. So you uh, you could start at Ranger Lake. We didn't. We started at, at, at Gong Lake. Now, we're lucky that road wasn't too bad, but I do know that it can get rough. And I'm going to go to a clip of, again, uh, of... Jonathan and Jonathan uh, was, was the one person that recently went on this. I gotta say something here. Like, so I'm showing clips of these YouTubers that have done the trips previously, not previously, lately. <laughs> and why? My Lord. But remember, I did this book to promote these areas so they're not lost. For me to actually see a bunch of young YouTubers doing the route and then promoting it, and even Jonathan actually showing the book that he's following is mine. Oh, that is incredible. I'm really excited for this trip. I'm doing the Ranger Lake Loop in Algoma. It's uh, not well traveled. I got it out of uh, Kevin Callan's Ontario's Lost Canoe Roots. And uh, I've just based on my research, it doesn't sound like it's well traveled at all. Show a quick overview of the route. So this is Ranger Lake here. I'm camp there. Heading up today into Stamo Lake. And then through a few small lakes. Gong Lake, this is where I was trying to get to in the uh, with the access roads. But early, this is just after ISO. Early spring is a bad time to be exploring forest roads. They're going to be flooded and washed out. So I have no signal here. And I'm... A little frightened. Okay, so I'm stuck. Uh, I have no signal. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I'm very far away from everything. <sighs> so I got out of that, uh, and I don't have the nerve to try it again. That was dumb. Anyway, so where I want to get to today is at the confluence of the uh, I'm not going to say it right, but Nishtuga, Nishtugani, Nishtugani, anyway, and the West of Binidong. So these two rivers come together here. This portage here is another reason I was trying to avoid or trying to get to here. Um, it says 900 meters, but uh, my reports say that whatever it is now, the portage, it's closer to three kilometers. So if that's the case, um, that really sucks to have to do that both ways, but, oh, and this is the book that this route is contained in, if you wanted to buy it, which you should. 
And the, I, I mean, really, how to make your day, how to make your, your week, how to make your year is to actually see young people piling these roots and hopefully they won't be lost. Yeah, so going back to the roots, so, um, so yeah, Jonathan tried to do this road and then, you know, couldn't do it in early spring, so he went from Ranger Lake. Uh, and, yeah, I so I never did the sportage. It was noted as uh, 940, but he said it's three kilometers, and I, I, I'll believe him. He was like, he did it, I didn't. We went from here. We went uh, up the west of Dong River, which is a slog, really. Um, wasn't maintained at all, but it was a good trip. <laughs> Oh. But, well, it's kind of refreshing traveling upstream today. It's pretty hot out. And it's the only way to get there, so why not? I worked really hard to get here. That's my payback. It's fantastic. Uh, one should never underestimate the rewards of taking the road less traveled. Went to Megasin Lake and the lodge that my dad and I stayed at, we flew in years ago, gosh, years ago, probably the se late 70s, um, was still there but was abandoned. It was a ghost town. And um, I'm not sure if anything's there anymore. What we did from there, though, is we flew out uh, and went back to Gong Lake. Actually, that was a misadventure in itself. So we couldn't get the flight out originally planned because the pilot was arrested. <laughs> so I thank goodness I had a sat phone, but it didn't have much battery because one guy that was kind of with Nancy Scott working for the government, he had used the phone quite a bit to phone his wife. Um, and we were running out of battery, but we did get another flight in two days later. All we had to eat at that time was prunes and some sugar. That was it for two days. And, uh, and some trip. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's another story. But you could, which I've done before, amazing trip. You go actually loop through and go down the, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but Nushitagani, uh, Gani, no, Nushitagani River. And yeah, uh, it's a great trip. Good for trip fishing there as well, but lots of log jams and no maintenance whatsoever, but it's doable. Low water it, an issue as well, so just watch it for that, but it's still a, a doable trip and nobody maintains this route, okay, nobody. So um, when we got back to Gong Lake, uh, yeah, um, both our vehicles were, our tires were slashed. <laughs> so you might wanna look into that. Um, I remember writing a, an article on this whole thing was everybody, you know, thinks wilderness canoe tripping is dangerous. Well, yeah, it is with people. I mean, the only misadventure we had here was the, you know, the pilot being arrested uh, up here and also our tires being slashed down here, but wilderness didn't really kick her butt. We were fine. Oh, spectacular. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, wow. How about that, Brookie? Is a thing of beauty. All right. Go for you, buddy. Oh. Oh. Beauty. Absolute beauty. That is beautiful. <laughs> oh my goodness. Please get in this net. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. It just gets bigger every time. Look at that rookie. Look at him. Red 
Sally. Oh, wow. Oh, I can't help but admire them. They're absolutely stunning. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Black Ensemble, Bark Lake Loop. Okay, Fisco Tasting, uh, Mississauga, Mississauga River. I can go on and on about this area. I love this area. I go paddling there all the time. It's amazing. But I want to do a shortcut into Bark Lake because Gray Owl's cabin. So Gray Owl was uh, Archie Blaney. Uh, he was an uh, uh, English guy that moved to Canada because of some life issues he had. And then he was a, was a ranger uh, in this area. And that was one of his cabins he kept along the way. Then he masqueraded as a First Nations person uh, for many years, wrote as Grey Owl, and everybody thought he was First Nations, probably not the First Nations people, they probably thought they knew it was hoax, but they kept quiet. And um, he did a lot. I mean, the whole saving of the beaver, um, when you, you could have a nickel, the, the beaver on the nickel, is because he actually saved the beaver from extinction. So he did a lot of good, uh, but he also was not a First Nations person. And then the media, uh, this would never happen today, but they held off because of all the good they were doing, because the North Bay Nugget, I think it was, knew that he was a fraud, but they didn't say anything until he died. And then he then he died, and then they told everyone, oh, by the way, you know, he's Archie Blaney, he was never real. Because he did so much good, um, they really, nobody really, well, we, we still praise him. All right, to go into uh, his cabin, uh, the quick way, you go into La Casable, into Barclay. So you go down uh, the road, uh, was it 533? I think. Anyway, so you, you go up from, from there from the main highway. The road gets really rough after you leave Rich Rich Resort, or Richie Falls Resort. It's really rough. It's all doable there. I mean, people even camp here on Crown Land for, for a bit with uh, RVs, so it's not too bad, but it's, you know, <laughs> It's, it, it's rough. So you head out from uh, Lakasaba Lake, go down these series of lakes into Bark Lake, incredible campsite there on a, on a massive uh, beach with huge red pine, which is really, you know, red pine are not really dominant in this area. So to see them, it was incredible. Huge red pine in this area as well. There was a forest fire. I forget the year that happened, probably in the 40s or 50s, headed down and they, it stopped at this point here. And so all the big pine here lived and uh, you got to experience it. It's incredible. The, the, the pine there is just incredible. So Bark Lake. So what we did is we camped here and then spent some days paddling around uh, Bark Lake, which is incredibly massive. And if you read Grey Owl's, uh, I forget the book actually, sorry. Um, hmm, uh, the, he describes this area and it's the same to, to this day. So there's the cabin. It's in a private area, a uh, private, it, it, oh my dog, my dog's snoring, my dog's snoring, it is midday, well, late, I think. but she's snoring, she's getting old, anyway, uh, yeah, the cabin is, is on private property, it's a, a lodge that I've never seen anybody at, it's locked, um, supposedly he signed the inside of it, it's nothing special, like really, the landscape itself is special, the cabin's not, so don't worry about it. But yeah, um, and then you could go back the same way, which I've done more so than the other, but I think I'm only twice I've actually gone the other way. You can go through these series of ponds and small creeks to, to make it a loop. Again, it's not maintained. We found these routes by like a beer can on a stick or a shotgun shell, whatever. That's how we have the portages along here. And I don't think that has changed. I don't think anybody's maintaining it. So just be aware of that. But yeah, it's well worth it. I love that trip. I do that for her beat. The Tata Shada <laughs> The Tata Shada bit. Oh my god, oh, oh, the 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 Tata Shada Pico River. Ah, there I said it. And uh this is an incredible trip. Well, when I did it, it was incredible. I, I know Brad uh, Jennings uh, recently did it, and I'll show the video. Uh, and it was burned all over. So um, it's totally different now. But you know, the river's still there. Forest is different, but the river's still there. Yeah. Brad has done amazing stuff towards Lost Canoe Roots. Uh, almost obsessive, to be quite honest, uh, since he was a kid with his dad. Now he works for the MNR uh, up in Timmins. 
and is still pursuing his dream to uh, explore and also document these canoe routes. This is an amazing route. I mean, it is a lost canoe route and it is quite haunting with all these uh, matchstick forests, all the dead trees, but it's pretty awesome. It's gnarly white water, great scenery, and it's just unique. You got to do this route. Most of the trails are decimated by blowdowns or wildfires, you name it, or just lack of use. So you got to use a bit of sleuthing and detective work to figure out what's on the ground and if you're actually on the historic canoe route. Keep an eye out for nails that were nailed to trees. There might be old tattered pieces of um, signs that are still hanging to the trees, very tiny remnants of it. Old remnants of a sign right there. Pretty cool. Look for a small little indent into the ground where people have trodden over the years. You might see bits of rotting wood that have been have a slow depression. Even with roots, there might be a slight depression as trees bend away as well too from where people used to traverse the area. Look for small openings and look for old blazes as well. You might find newer ones and the old ones look like a gnarled curled over spot, but it's essentially a spot on a tree that has been blazed, i.e. cut by an ax to kind of guide your way along on the portage trail. Rapids ahead. Okay. How's everybody doing? <laughs> uh, I think I saw recording. Yeah, I did. For sure, screen. Uh, I'll go, I'm gonna put the chat on, and I showed you a whole bunch of routes. Lots more to come. In 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 a few days from now, I'll actually have more routes up on my uh, Casey Happy uh, Camper channel. And I thought I would end with that one because it's. All the other routes I'm talking about really are more towards my area, not your area. And also to end with Bradley, I think was amazing because uh, Bradley, a young guy, uh, he actually went to uh, the, the college I, I've worked at for over 30 years part-time uh, for natural resources. And he he's decided to redo these lost canoe routes. And uh, I'm pretty sure he'll have a book out in the next few years. I'm pushing him to do, do that. so. Uh, so it's kind of cool that, I, I, that it, it's just keep going. So, um, Excellent. Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Yeah, I just uh, was checking the chat box. I dropped your uh, YouTube uh, link in the chat there so people can subscribe to your channel there, uh, Casey Happy Camper. A uh, lot of great info there. Uh, really exciting. I love how uh, just uh, 
untouched, it seems. Yeah, well, we're, you know, we're kind of I mean, in a way, it's, there's like there's remnants and stuff, but it's like. Yeah, yeah, we know. really are blessed in Ontario. Like, I, I've traveled a, a lot, the United States, uh, Wales, uh, Scotland, Ireland, um, England, and talked about canoe routes. And people that were presenting before me about their area, fantastic scenery, but they'll see nobody in two hours where for us, we'll see nobody for 10, 12 days. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we don't get that. We don't get how lucky we are. Yeah. And so when I did these lost canoe routes, we're kind of uh, kind of spoiled kids, right? Um, we don't really know what we have, but- uh, Right. But at the same time, the way the, the government goes here, and I, I'm not an activist to talk about the government, whatever, but I, I do know the whole system, is that if you don't promote those routes, they'll do something with them. Uh, resource extraction, uh, damming for-, for for uh, energy so um because we have this rule here that if it's a if it's navigable canoe route that they can't really touch it because it's an historical canoe route so we have to keep wow. proving that it's an historical route so yeah. that book was really important for me and actually what was kind of ironic is that that there there everybody told me well it won't sell and now everybody wants it right so <laughs> got a question here um looks like someone's asking if you've ever done the turtle river uh i might butcher the name here Ignis to Mine yep. Center? Yep, yep. So there's two ways to do the Turtle River. You can go from the bottom up into uh, the water uh, castle or from the top down. Uh, the top down is completely lost right now. Uh, there, there used to be a, um, uh, actually a school group and uh, volunteer groups that used to maintain that route because that's where actually Jimmy McEwitt went down to build the castle from. But yeah, um, the last well it might might have changed the last two two years but the last two years i would say that good luck to you from going from ignis down um <laughs> you would have to go from the, the bottom up which the actually is a nicer route too turtle river is amazing the turtle river actually is called turtle river because it has turtle native uh, uh uh paintings along the way it's a very historic route and you've got the the jimmy kewick castle which is poor guy 1914 he got all this money from a gold mine and then lost it all mail order a bride from scotland uh then she found out he was living in a shack so she goes well i'm not i'm not showing up so he built this castle for her oh, wow. so you got to see that castle wow so there's a group from ignace that, that actually is trying to restore it and they're doing okay it's just a this you know it's not easy to catch up with something that was built in 1914 i would say if you're going to do the whole entire turtle river the last day or two um, is very lowland um, swamp maple. It almost looks like Southern Ontario, uh, not Northern Ontario. So you might want to take out before that. Okay, nice. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just checking out some of your um, videos here, your, your uh, playlist. Um, would you mind telling me a little bit about this Whiskey Fireside Chat series you got going on? <laughs> That's it's, interesting. A, it, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Um, so many years ago, I started doing Whiskey Fireside Chat every month or whatever just to keep things sewing and in, in concession right and yeah. uh interviewing people or myself and then what happened last year during uh, covid lockdown i was going to do a documentary and interview all the people that would motivate pallers to motivate pallers and and i talked about that last night on, on your show yeah. and, and um then the lockdown happened. So I was like, well, there goes that job. <laughs> and so uh, I, I was here by myself uh, with the dog and and uh, for 14 weeks. And I thought, well, if I don't do something, I'll go insane. So uh, I ended up interviewing all these really well-known paddlers. I know because I've been around for a long time in the canoe world, got to know a lot of people uh, as, as friends. And then and they had nothing else to do because they're locked down as well. And I did a whole bunch of interviews. It was fantastic. But then lately, because uh, we're locked down again here in Ontario, uh, you guys are lucky right now. Uh, we're, we're not doing well in Ontario right now. And um, so I started interviewing them again, a whole bunch of people. So, nice. yeah, so I've, I've done a few uh, last couple of weeks and then a whole bunch more for the next four weeks. So, And Whiskey Chat, uh, I love my scotch. Uh, <laughs> I got I to say, um, I, I'm a, I actually, I, I collect scotch. I collect old canoe books. Cool. Um, uh, but I'm not the D Martin of the canoe world. Like, uh, they, uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's just a it, it's a good way to get people to gather around and talk about why this commu uh, community that we belong to is so special. Yeah, I'm just kind of scrolling through some of the comments here. I, I posted a link to uh, I think the recent one, number 84, with Adam Schultz. 
Yeah. Um, there's a lot of great chatter here in the YouTube uh, comment section. And um, look, some of these range, you know, 48 minutes, a few minutes, et cetera. So really a nice varied um Kind of choose your own adventure on that uh, fire you, you, you know the great thing about the great thing about those chats though is it's a catch way too because i knew everybody i, I interviewed until mm -hmm. i interviewed adam schultz and he's a well-known uh canadian author here yeah. he's rated as uh right now the top uh canadian explorer i just don't know the guy and that was my first interview i did where i don't know the person oh, and cool. uh i had a really good chat with him i had a really good solid chat with him and um I, I think that sometimes that, that's really good just not to know the person until the end of the chat. And that, I think that's what, what a fireside chat, whiskey chat is all about, right? Yeah, and, that, that seems to really kind of encapsulate the essence, at least from my perspective. Um, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I think that, you know, whatever similarities or differences there may be in, in a certain topic, I think, you know, having that chat and figuring that out and is just wonderful. It's a great yeah, way to you, do it. And you really should check that interview out. And actually, Adam will actually even say that because he like he's a celebrity here right so uh whether that's good or bad because in one sense that could be bad because there's a lot of old guard pallers that are saying sure who is this young kid that's done all these things like wh who are he who is he right. my job was just to have a chat with him and i knew he had done so much media before but i asked him questions that media had never asked him before oh and, great and, yeah yeah, yeah. And it's almost like we're at the Midwest again, like like back in the days where we would go went by the, the canoes and had a, had a bonfire and beer. Yeah. That's a whiskey fireside shot. It's not an interview on TV. Right, right. right? Yeah. yeah. So, and he, actually, <laughs> yeah, he, he quite enjoyed it. I, I, I threw some pretty hard questions at him uh, because people were saying, because I'm the old guard, right? So people yeah, were sure. saying, hey, you know, like you ask him this question, ask him this question. And love it. Love it. That's great. Yeah. The nice thing about those whiskey fireside shots, they're all mine. Nobody's telling me who to interview. Yeah. Nobody's telling me what to do. I'm in a lockdown right now. I got nothing else except to talk to really good people. Yeah. Uh, hey, Kevin, do you, I, maybe I should know this as sort of the moderator, but do you have a podcast or any sort of podcast that you, that you follow or are you into that sort of thing at all? Yeah, so I do, I'm on a lot of podcasts. I decide not to do my own. I, I've been asked that a lot. Uh, yeah. I just, there was a certain point where I, I'm a really busy person. I'm like squirrel and I'm really hyper and I do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a workaholic, well, I am a workaholic, but, um, but I, I, there was one day where I thought I'm better off doing podcasts as opposed to having my own. Sure. And yeah. Yeah. so, uh, yeah, so the one I really like is Paul Curley, a uh, podcast in the UK. Uh, on, on bushcraft he's really good um Powell radio um which is actually here in canada which is really good and cw that's actually uh just just one state over from you guys i yeah. I, I, I cliff jacobson and i we're, we're on his show a lot nice um i i enjoy that but that's why i like the whiskey fireside chats because i'm i get interviewed a lot uh, yeah, to the point yeah. that it's like okay uh, we've heard that story kevin so <laughs> I, I, and uh, my my colleagues were saying geez kevin i i, I listen to your whiskey chassis so you don't say much of anything you just ask questions you don't tell any stories like well it's not about me yeah you know? yeah yeah it's, well, i really like that part i love it cool well i'm i'm looking forward to diving down that series diving into that series here on your youtube page um thanks for doing that and uh having that sort of space to create you know create content for yourself and you know, and ask different questions. Um, just want to say thanks for being such a great partner to the store here in Minneapolis for so long. And uh, I know you were on yesterday. If you missed that, uh, Kevin presented on Paddlers Who Motivate Paddlers. That uh, was recorded and it'll probably be out uh, up on our YouTube page probably within a day or so, as will this one. So if you missed any of Kevin's presentations or any of the other presentations, you can catch them there on that uh, YouTube uh, page, uh, Midwest Mountaineering page there. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat here, so this seems like a, maybe a good time to sign off. Again, I just want to say thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate your time and knowledge and willingness to share it with everyone. Um, I hope we can definitely have our big heated tents and bonfires and chats in the uh, fireside chat in our boatyard here soon. So I look forward to that. But uh, until then, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. And I'm really lo looking forward to going back and we're all the canoes and we having hamburgers and, and bad yes. beer and yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, who knows if there'll be any canoes. The demand has been in, it's been hard to keep up even at oh, a yeah. sales, at a sales level here. And then, you know, we've been hearing from our, from our vendors, you know, they're, they're working 
very hard trying to get these boats out the door and and, and still maintain the level yeah. of craftsmanship that's that, that we all know to love and grow to love so i really commend yeah. everyone in the industry for um you know just buckling down and, and just doing it as, uh, through through all of this so thank you to everyone out there who's watching as well it's a totally different time right now and i know that right now you're probably thinking there's going to be some unethical people in the woods because there's so many people going out but more so there's going to be some people that really want to uh, be given direction yeah. uh, and um and we need that right now the more people yeah. we get in the wilderness and connect with it the more we'll protect it great 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 note to end on there all right thanks kevin Thanks a lot. Bye now.